We turn now to today's message from the passage of Ruth, from the book of Ruth. Turn with me to Ruth chapter 4, reading from verse 1 to verse 12. Ruth chapter 4, reading from verse 1 to verse 12. It says in Ruth chapter 4, starting from verse 1, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city, and said, sit here. So they sat down. When he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And this close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, The close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Melon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Melon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. This is the word of God. We come to this message today, the fulfillment of redemption. Covering Ruth chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 12. We have seen over the past few weeks as we go through the book of Ruth, the overarching theme of this book is God's providence and redemption. We have seen how Ruth was such a destitute woman. She had nothing. She came from the land of Moab to Judah, Bethlehem. And she had to gain favor from someone by gleaning in the fields. Ruth is a Moabite woman who professed faith in the God of Israel. You remember how she actually confessed, 
to her mother when her mother told her to return, go back to your home country, go back to your own gods, go back to your own people. And you remember the immortal words that Ruth said in Ruth chapter 1? She says, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. She showed her faith in returning to Judah with Naomi. And through the providence of God, she came to the field of Boaz. She was gleaning from the field of Boaz. She was picking up the leftovers so that she can eat. And we saw last week, Boaz was a type of Christ. Type meaning that it is pointing us to a spiritual reality. Boaz is a type and shadow of the coming Savior. Boaz's life and this, in this narrative, in this story, he acts as a redeemer to Ruth. He redeems Ruth. And that picture points us to the ultimate redeemer, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. So as Boaz redeems Ruth, we see how Jesus Christ is redeeming us. And Jesus Christ is the ultimate redeemer who is related to us. We saw that how last week Boaz had to be rightly related to Ruth in order to redeem her. Similarly, Jesus Christ had to be rightly related to us to redeem us. And how is he rightly related to us? He took on perfect human nature so that he could be like us and to die as a sacrifice for us. He laid down his life on the cross as a ransom for his people. So today, as we move on to the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth, we're going to see Boaz's marriage to Ruth points us to the fulfillment of redemption. It is not just a wonderful ending to a romantic story, but rather it points us to the triune God through whom the redemption of sinners is accomplished. At the end of chapter 3, you remember that Naomi expressed her confidence in Boaz. In that last verse, in uh, verse 18 of chapter 3, she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter of this day. Naomi and Ruth had done all that they could. There's no more that they could do than to just wait right now. Then now you come to chapter 4. You find out that her confidence was actually not misplaced after all. Boaz is taking action. We know that at the same time as Boaz takes action, God is also taking action. God is bringing into completion what he actually started. He brought Ruth, this Moabite woman, to the land of Judah. And through God's providence, he took her to the field of Boaz, that she may actually be gleaning there. And Boaz showed favor upon her. And then the Almighty God, through his sovereign power, working through the decisions and the plans of Naomi, brought Ruth to the threshing floor where Boaz was. Ruth then laid at his feet, and she says, Take me under your wing, for you are my kinsman redeemer. She says, Marry me. We saw as well that this was all part of the leveret marriage law back in the day. It was found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. There was absolutely no moral impropriety whatsoever when Ruth did this. Boaz knew exactly what she was doing. He knew exactly what was happening. And he responded by saying, I will do for you all that you request. But then there's a sudden twist to the plot of the story. You remember that at the end of last week, we saw how Boaz, after saying that I will do all that you request, then all of a sudden there is a halt to the story. He says that, there is actually another man. He 
is actually closer than I am. If he wants to redeem you, let him redeem you. But if not, I will. And so, that was where we left off in our story. It left us hanging. We're like, what happened? What happened next? Ruth has already done her part. She has sought out her kinsman redeemer. She has went after and sought her kinsman redeemer. She was asking. She has asked him. She has sought him. She has actually knocked on his door. And now she's just waiting for him. What is going to happen next? Are they going to get married? This is what's going to be studied here in Ruth chapter 4. And the story now brings us here. We are going to look at three sections in Ruth chapter 4, verse 1 to 12 here. The first section will be from verses 1 to 4, which we are going to call, we are going to call this the initiative of redemption. Then from verses 5 to 10, we will see the execution of redemption. Then in verses 11 and 12, we will see the application of redemption. Beginning with verse 1, it says, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. Boaz is a man of action. He takes initiative. He goes to the gate of the city. And we need to recognize something here. There's no doubt that Boaz understood that God was sovereign over all things. Boaz is a godly man. We saw that in the previous chapters. Boaz knew that God was involved from the beginning. In verse 13 of chapter, eight, uh, of chapter 3, in the previous chapter, you will see that he says, I will perform the duty for you as kinsman redeemer as long as the Lord Yahweh lives. As long as the covenant God of Israel lives, I will perform the role of kinsman redeemer, he says. And throughout the whole book of Ruth, Boaz has used this covenantal name of God, Yahweh. It's not just God, but he's using Yahweh, Jehovah, the covenanted name of God and Israel. And he's noted Ruth's relationship with God as well. So he, Boaz, is very aware that God is working through this. But yet, it does not mean that he could be inactive. It does not mean that he just sat back and do nothing. If God wants me to do something, he'll make it happen. If God wants it to happen, it'll happen. No. He knows that God is working, but he also knows that there is an action that he has to take. So in an immediate way, he takes care of this matter. And I want you to think about this. Sink it into our minds and into our hearts. I think sometimes we can be so careless. We use the sovereignty of God as an excuse for our own inactivity. We tend to say, oh, God is sovereign, therefore I don't need to lift a finger. If he wants to feed me, he'll drop food from heaven. No, my friends. We can talk about the activity of God and take that to mean that you and I don't need to do anything. Is that the case? We don't have to plan. We don't have to decide. We don't have to work. Since God is sovereign, everything will happen according to his will, right? No. That is false doctrine, my friends. The, facts, the fact is that God is at work when we are at work concurrently. He is at work in us, through us, accomplishing his will. And Boaz understood that. So Boaz here takes action. And notice that it is not just action that he's taking, but there's actually a strategy in his action. He goes up to the gate of the city. A city like Bethlehem, 
at that time, the gate of the city is where all the major transactions happened. It was the major market of that day. It was a place where people would do business. It is a place where the elders of the city would actually gather. It was a place where legal matters were transacted. It served as a courthouse. Boaz, he understood that that was the case. And he used his common sense. He used his common sense to say, if I want to find this closer relative of Ruth, of Naomi, the best place that I can go is the gate of the city. My friends, just because we believe in the sovereignty of God does not mean that we don't take normal steps. Does not mean that we use we don't use normal senses that God has given to us to make decisions, to take action. It does not mean that we cannot use the senses that God gave us. God uses all of the senses that he has given to us to help us make decisions. And through our decisions and through our actions, he accomplishes his holy will. So Boaz got up. He went to the city gate. And he was probably sitting there waiting and looking for this closer relative of Naomi. And behold, a close relative, it says. Behold, a close relative. Was it by chance that the close relative just so happened to walk by? Certainly not. It was by God's providence that behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. God is at work behind the scenes. We see his providence. We see his sovereignty. He is working all of these events together. And Boaz sees this close relative, and what does he say? He says, turn aside, friends, sit down here. Notice that the name of this close relative is not even mentioned. In fact, if you're using a Bible with a margin, you would see the word friend there. There's actually a note by the side margin. It actually, in Hebrew, is Poloni Amoni. And what does that mean in English? The closest translation that they actually have there is Mr. So-and-so. There's no direct English translation of Poloni Almoni. So-and-so. It's not that Boaz didn't know this close relative's name. It's not even that Boaz didn't call out his name or anything like that. But rather, the writer of this book thought that it is not fitting to have his name recorded here. As he was writing this book through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there was no need to record the name of this person. And many of the commentators actually think that since this nearer kinsman chose not to perpetuate the name of the dead, the author saw it fit not to perpetuate his name either. We don't know his name, but God has a reason for that. He is not going to be of the line of David. Mr. So-and-so, sit down here. Boaz, you remember he was a person of high stature in society. He was a wealthy man. He owned fields. He was a godly man that even his workers respected him. So when Boaz wanted to talk to you in the city gate, you better listen. Hey, he says, Mr. So-and-so, sit down here. And what does Boaz do next? He assembles a legal meeting in verse 2. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. What is Boaz doing here? Boaz is securing the redemption of Ruth by following the legal process. We need to understand that before Boaz can actually redeem Ruth, he has to go through the legal process of redeeming her to secure that place of the kinsman redeemer. 
he can't just bypass the law of kinsman redeemer. He's not going to do anything to jeopardize his redemption of Ruth. So he follows the legal process of that day. He fulfills the legal sanctions of being a redeemer. So we see here as well that Boaz arranged for this court session with the full elders involved, all 10 of them. If you were to turn back to Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19, you can actually see that you don't need 10 elders involved. You don't need 10 witnesses. All you need is two or three witnesses. But Boaz, in this case, assembled the full panel of elders to preside over this, to make sure that there is absolutely no ambiguity whatsoever. Then in verses 3 and 4, Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my, my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Boaz starts with saying, Naomi has this piece of land. She sold the piece of land belonging to her husband, who is our brother Elimelech. Remember in Leviticus, God had made provision in his law for families to sell their property, to sell their land when they are in need of money. But God also made provisions in his law for the preservation of the family, for the prosperity and the pr preservation of the family name. So whenever you actually sell a property, 50 years later, every 50 years in the year of Jubilee, all of the debts will be forgotten. It will be forgiven. And all of the land that you actually pawn off or you actually sell off will be returned to your family. That was the ancient law of that day. So if a person is poverty stricken, if a person is absolutely poor and destitute, you can actually sell your property as a 50 year leasehold, we call it today. In a way, through that law, God was reminding them that all of their possessions still belong to God. And all the land belong to him. In fact, in Leviticus 25, 23, it says, The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. So God wants them to understand that everything you own belongs to me. But he also, in that statement, says, I don't want you putting roots down in this world. This is not your home. Your home is the heavenly home. You are aliens and sojourners along with me here in this world. You're looking for a better home, a better country. And so Boaz shows wisdom and integrity in that he assembles the elders and he begins to state the case. He started by saying to this close relative, Naomi has a piece of land that needs to be redeemed. Boaz makes it clear what the redemption rights are. He says, first in line as kinsman redeemer is you. Will you serve as kinsman redeemer to redeem this property? And what does Mr. So-and-so say? Yes, I will redeem it. Perhaps this close relative thinks that he could actually use that extra piece of land. Right? If I'm a farmer, I want an extra piece of land to actually farm on. Maybe I can produce more. Oh, if you have been following the plot of this story, it's been building up in anticipation, isn't it? Ruth, who was coming from Moab, had nothing. And then slowly she gains favor from Boaz. 
And Boaz promises her that he will marry her, he will redeem her, he will do exactly as what she wished. And then all of a sudden, oh, your heart sink. What, man? Someone else is going to redeem Ruth. What's going on here? Boaz, why did you give this guy the right to redeem her? Now he gets to have Ruth. But there is yet another twist to this plot of the story, and we'll see that later. A few observations to be made about these first four verses. The first is that Boaz takes the initiative. He takes control of the situation. He finds the closer relative. He calls the court session together. He basically works out all the details to be the redeemer. Similarly, God takes initiative to choose us and plan our salvation. Our salvation is not by chance, my friends. Our salvation is all planned out by God. He was the one who took that initiative. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Just as God, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Before the foundation of the world, before you were even born, before you even came into existence, God had already knew that you were coming. He had chosen you from eternity past. He took the initiative to save you. We are like Ruth. We are totally depraved. But God, who is rich in His mercy, has made us alive quicken us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. The initiative of redemption is from God. We love God because He first loved us. And it's not the other way around. The second observation to make is, notice how this closer, redeem, close, closer relative, Mr. So-and-so, responded. He jumped on the opportunity to get that extra piece of land. Right? He said, I will redeem it. He hasn't heard everything that entails as kinsman redeemer. But all he could think of is that, that piece of land that I could actually get. Oh, how wonderful would that be? And many a times, don't we behave the same way? We get excited and say yes without really counting the costs. Proverbs 18 says, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Similarly, before you and I follow Jesus Christ, before any of us make up our mind to be a follower of Christ, to commit our life as having Him as our master, have you counted the cost? Have you weighed out what it actually entails as a follower of Jesus Christ? Jesus said that if you, if you are truly to be his disciple, you have to take up your cross daily and to follow him. You have to suffer. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Christ said that. So as we decide to follow Christ, is that something that you say, oh, it's really cool to be a Christian nowadays. I want to be a Christian. Or have you really counted the cost of being a Christian? Now in verse 5, we see the twist to the plot. After Mr. So-and-so agrees to be kinsman redeemer, Boaz says, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess. Boaz is being wise here. Clearly, Boaz is in love with Ruth. He wants to redeem Ruth for himself. And so you see that emphasis that he made there? Ruth, the Moabitess. You remember earlier in the previous chapters, he was calling her, my daughter. 
But now he's actually calling her Ruth the Moabitess. He's highlighting the fact that she is a foreigner to this other Mr. So-and-so, this close of kinsman. He's saying, you realize that this lady is actually not a Jew. She's a Moabitess. And as though that's not enough, he goes on to then say, you remember Elimelech's son, Mehlon? You remember what the meaning of Mehlon is? Sickly. Sickly. You remember sickly Mehlon? Ruth is the wife of that sickly Mehlon. So as kinsman redeemer, you have to perpetuate the name of sickly, of Mehlon, through this wife of his, through his inheritance. Then, of course, the closer relative then backs out of the deal. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself. I can't redeem it, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. This closer relative, when he looked at securing just the property itself, it seemed like a good deal. But when he actually took a little more attention, he paid a little bit more attention, he realized that this is not a good deal after all. When he hears that he has to take on the Moabitess as his wife, and then he hears that he has to raise up children in the name of the dead, and he has to perpetuate the name of sickly Mehlon, all of a sudden it dawns on him that his own inheritance is going to be jeopardized. Perhaps he is thinking that he didn't want to dilute his own property to his existing children. His existing children is going to be taking on the inheritance of him. And if he were to have more children through Ruth, he was going to need to dilute them. I don't want to have my property passed down and divided among a Gentile woman's inheritance. You can't help but notice there is that potential racial, uh, 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 that, that racial uh, uh, angst that he has that I don't want to be married to a Moabitess. You remember again back in the day, the Jews were always at enmity against the Moabites. They, in fact, look upon the Moabites as second class. They don't even like the Moabites. And now he's being asked to perpetuate the name of sickly through this lady, Ruth, the Moabitess. Remember that this was the leverage marriage found in Deuteronomy 25. We saw that last week. Both Boaz and Mr. So-and-so were well familiar with it. They knew that that was what's going to happen. Now in verse 7, it says, This was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandals and gave it to the other. That this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. You see here that Boaz follows the legal process 100%. He wants to make sure that he's securing the redemption of Ruth. Absolutely. Not just partially, but completely. Then in verse 9, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Melon's from the hand of Naomi. Boaz declares that because of Mr. So-and-so's relinquishing of his right as redeemer, he now has the right as, redeem, as redeemer. Boaz now has the right as the kinsman redeemer. He has complete ownership over everything that has been lost. Everything that Elimelech had given up is now for him to actually redeem. So Boaz... You see this story, how exciting it is, right? He now is able to own it all. It's all now mine, which was forfeited. It now all belongs to me. But that's not really the most important thing to Boaz, is it? Because in verse 10, he says, 
Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Melon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. Legally speaking, the land and all of Elimelech's property is now Boaz. But remember, Boaz was rich to begin with. He was a wealthy man. He probably couldn't care less about the assets that he will be redeeming. It might be just a small fraction of his total portfolio. What's more important to him is that he was going to acquire the hand of Ruth to be his wife. Now he can fulfill the role of kinsman redeemer. Now he can fulfill his responsibility to her. What are the spiritual lessons that we can glean from this section from verse 5 to verse 10? Note, first of all, that Boaz was the only willing redeemer. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate redeemer who is willing and able. There's no one else who is going to be willing. There's no one else who is willing and able. John 10, verse 17 says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. Jesus Christ laid down his life willingly. God created us But because we are sinful, because we are sinners and estranged from Him, we are lost in our sins. But God, through His grace, through His mercy, sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to willingly die on the cross of Calvary, to save for Himself His people, to redeem us. Jesus Christ, by his death, paid the price to buy us back. He redeemed us through his blood on the cross. We have sinful natures. Our sinful nature deserves damnation. In order for us to be saved, we need to be redeemed. Someone needs to pay for the sins that we have committed. Because we deserve damnation, because we have offended God, He must punish us because He is a holy and just God. But God at the same time is a God of love. He is full of mercy. And this is what we have seen in the book of Ruth. There is no need for Boaz to actually redeem Ruth. He was already rich and wealthy. And similarly, our God, He does not need us to be complete. He is already complete by Himself. But He redeems us from our sins because of His love for us. It's not because of any good in us. It's not because He saw that we will be better people than others. But it is because He loved us that He died on the cross to redeem us, to pay for our sins. Then we see how Boaz sealed the deal as kinsman redeemer. He is not only willing, but he went through the legal process. He took all the steps necessary to complete the legal requirement as kinsman redeemer. Jesus Christ is not only willing to lay down his life to redeem us, but he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law that we failed to keep. For the law could not do, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his only begotten son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. 
He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Jesus Christ came to take on perfect human nature, to live a life that fulfills the law of God on our behalf because we fail to live a life fulfilling the laws of God. Jesus Christ redeemed us by fulfilling the legal requirement of living a perfect and holy life. And he died as that perfect and holy sacrifice for our sins, that we no longer may die, that we can have everlasting life. Then in verse 11 and 12, all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. Then comes the blessing. It says, may the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. They pronounce the blessing of the marriage of, Booth, of uh, Boaz and Ruth. All the witnesses there say, may Ruth be like Rachel and Leah, the two mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Rachel and Leah were the wives of Jacob, through whom the nation of Israel came into being. And the people are now asking God to multiply them, multiply their offspring like Rachel and Leah. Then they bless Boaz and his wealth and his fame to spread in Bethlehem. Ephrathah is actually the old name of Bethlehem. When you think of Bethlehem, what, what comes to mind? Jesus Christ. It is the place of birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is why the Bible makes it clear in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Listen to these words. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Who is this message talking about? It's none other than Jesus Christ, our Savior. Micah is from the Old Testament. Christ has not even come yet at that time. So what does this, this blessing actually mean? What does this blessing that the witnesses and the elders are actually giving to Boaz and Ruth? What they are saying is that may your seed, Boaz and Ruth, may your seed be rich and famous throughout the land of Bethlehem. Then in verse 12, May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. What do you remember of the tribe of Judah? If you were to think of the tribe of Judah, what comes to mind? It is the royal tribe. The tribe of Judah is where all the kings came from. King David, King Solomon, they all come from the tribe of Judah. It is actually declared in Genesis chapter 49 that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh. That is peace. The scepter of the king will not depart from the tribe of Judah until the prince of peace comes. This blessing or this prayer by the witnesses speaks to us of the Holy Spirit's work. When we pray, when we pray, we are expressing our dependence on God. Similarly, as much as Boaz has taken action to complete his legal obligation as kinsman redeemer, the Lord is the one who is in control. Unless the Lord builds out his house, those who labor will labor in vain. So we 
as much as we are used as instruments of God, we have to decide, we have to plan, we have to take action. But we are also dependent on the Holy Spirit to bless. All our efforts are just futile unless God blesses it. Our prayer therefore expresses our dependence on God. The Spirit in us helps us in our weaknesses. Boaz points us to Christ. The Spirit of God will work such that many sons and daughters will be born as the gospel is being proclaimed. So the seed that is going to be coming from Boaz and Ruth, Christ Jesus will come through the lineage. And through Christ Jesus, the seeds will be scattered through all the earth. And those who repent from their sins and trust in Christ alone, those are the seeds and children of Abraham. So if you have had faith in Christ as your Redeemer, you are one of the blessings that the people are saying of today. You are one of the seeds. We take a step back. We have looked at this first 12 verses. It's quite amazing, isn't it, this story? This story is packed with drama and suspense. This is a romance of redemption. Boaz not only redeems Ruth, but there is this romance going on. And that is also a reflection of Christ's love for his people, for his bride, for the church. Who is the church? It is us. It is us Christians. Christians are the ones that make up the church. The church is not the building. The church is the people. In fact, back in the day, they don't call the church a building. They call it the meeting place. Because it is the people that gather together that make up the church. Ezekiel chapter 16. God uses marriage as a very vivid and graphic illustration of his relationship with his people. In verse 8 of Ezekiel 16, he uses this vivid imagery that is also seen in the book of Ruth. It says there in Ezekiel 16 verse 8, I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord of God. We see this very tender, affectionate way that God refers to his people. Then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, we see, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might be sanctified and cleansed with her, with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Just as Boaz redeemed Ruth through the legal process, there was also romance involved. Likewise, our redemption in Jesus Christ is not just a legal transaction where he died to pay for our sins and his righteousness is counted as ours. No, it's not just a plain, loveless, emotionless transaction. It is actually filled with romance. There is love. There is a covenantal union between Christ and his church. We are a fallen race. We are sinful human beings. Because of our sin, our legal status is that of holy condemnation. God has to punish us because of our legal status. We cannot save ourselves. But Christ came to redeem us, not just as his people, but as his bride. Our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, came to redeem his bride. Just like Boaz, he has to follow the legal process. 
He has to fulfill the requirements of the law. What are the requirements of the law that Christ has to fulfill for us? Galatians 4 tells us, Galatians 4.4, 4, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. We fail to keep the righteousness of God. We fail to keep the righteous requirement of the law. We sin against our God in our words, in our thoughts, in our deeds. Every single day we sin. And our sins need to be paid for. Someone needs to redeem us to pay for our sins. Then another legal requirement is actually described to us in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, 48, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Are you perfect? Have you kept the Ten Commandments perfectly? Have you lied? Have you lust? Have you honored your parents as you ought to? The kinsman redeemer who can redeem us must fulfill both requirements. One is to pay for the sins, and another is to be perfect. So the kinsman redeemer needs to be without sin. He must be perfectly righteous if he is to fulfill the legal requirement of redemption. He cannot be a sinner. He must be perfect. He must be perfect to fulfill the law of God on behalf of his bride. So my dear friends, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he is that kinsman redeemer. His perfect obedience of the law and his perfect righteousness fulfills the legal requirement to be our kinsman redeemer. He is the legal representative on our behalf. He is our redeemer. We are his bride. Romans 8 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law of God on our behalf. He is our kinsman redeemer who fulfilled all the legal requirements of redemption. He secured us as his bride. But he did not do that just for the sake of fulfilling the law. He did it because he loves his bride. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his people. Friends, I ask you in all earnestness today, has the Lord Jesus Christ loved you? Is he your kinsman redeemer? Has his blood paid for your sins? Has his love embraced you as his bride? I'm not asking whether you have said the sinner's prayer. I'm not asking whether you have walked to the aisle and responded to an altar call or anything like that. I'm not asking whether you have come to church every single Sunday. I'm asking you in your hearts of hearts, do you know Jesus Christ as your kinsman redeemer? Has he embraced you under his wing, taken you into his bosom as a member of his bride? The invitation is to you today. He says, come, you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Repent from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, and he will give you everlasting life. There is no redeemer except Christ. He is the ultimate spiritual kinsman redeemer that we need. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the Lord that we failed to fulfill. Redemption is planned by the Father. It was executed by the Son. 
and it was applied by the Holy Spirit. Come and seek Christ as your Redeemer. Today, turn from your sins and trust in Him. Let us close.